Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is Amber Mundinger from WWD. Today's webinar is on wholesale fashion, how to increase sales and reduce vendor allowances through analytics. We have Gretchen Jesrick, the VP of Marketing and Product Management from First Insights, as well as Keith Duplain, the SVP and General Manager of Calaris with us. So thank you guys again for joining. Just as a reminder, if you have any questions or needs, please type them in the chat window that you see on the screen, and I will be happy to help you. Or if you have any questions in terms of Q&A, you can submit them via the, the Q&A pod, and I will take a look at those, and we will ask those at the end of the webinar in a moderated Q&A session. Thank you so much. Gretchen, take it away. Thank you, Amber. Um, good day, everyone. Thank you for joining. We all know that the retail environment is, is really tough out there and getting tougher. Just today, another bankruptcy was announced, Aeropostale. As the saying goes, smooth seas do not make a skillful mariner. In really tough times, we need to up our game and get better at what we do. And today, we'd, we'd like to talk about a tool that that helps wholesalers and their retail partners make better assortment selection and pricing decisions. And we'll get that from the perspective of Calaris, a footwear wholesaler. So if you're a merchant or a buyer, <laughs> you're basically never right. You always buy too much or maybe you buy not enough. So how can you minimize your risk? Organizations including Gartner and, and MIT Sloan have reported that at least 50% of new products are considered failures. So what's the scope of this problem? Um, this, in fact, has been labeled a $1.1 trillion program, problem globally, um, reported by IHL. And First Insight has benchmarked this across the 8 million plus data points that we're collecting every month across retailers in different categories and different geographies, uh, representing over $200 billion in combined revenues. And so I'm sharing some of these benchmark data with you today. Um, our analysis, in fact, has shown that over 60% of new products fail. So splitting that out um, by different geographies, the, the failure, sorry, success rate in North America um, is running at 36% um, versus 33% in Europe. When we look at this by men's and women's, uh, we see a, a lower success rate in women's products. And uh, as it pertains to the, the category that we're discussing today, uh, women's footwear has shown particularly low success rates um, at approximately 21%. So, so like um, yeah, so Gretchen, I... You're going to jump in, all right, to my slide here, and I want to just kind of level set everybody um, on particularly the wholesale challenges. I think, uh, you know, if for all of you that are wholesalers out there understanding that we're kind of all in the same boat about everyone's driven towards growth. Um, to do that today, it's really a market share game, you know, uh, footwear specifically. You know, you, you may get low single-digit growth um, in a good year. And so how do you capture market share? How do you do that while minimizing risk? And and then really putting the consumer at the center of um, your wholesale strategies. And that's one of sort of, as we approach the challenge in total, one of the reasons that we landed at Calaris, we landed with uh, First Insight to help solve those problems. Great. Thank you, Keith. And we'll hear a lot more from Keith uh, further on in the webinar about the specific applications at Calaris. So shifting gears a little bit into how the First Insight solution can help wholesalers to pick, price, and plan um, new products is what's up next. So our approach is, is very straightforward. It's a four-step process. It starts with picking the items that you want to test, um, engaging with consumers, and that's done uh, via email to get uh, consumers to play through a game link. Uh, it can also be served up through social media or on a website, um, but email is the primary vehicle. Um, we get the feedback then from consumers, uh, apply our analytics, and feed the insights back to our customers. 
And all of that is accomplished uh, within 24 to 72 hours. So this is quite fast and, and also very scalable. We have companies testing hundreds and even thousands of new products per week through the solution. So selecting the items, um, these would be new items that you want to test. We are also able to test uh, existing products, but the real sweet spot of the solution is giving you information about products before they come to market. So it's kind of the idea of what would the value of tomorrow's Wall Street Journal be to you today? Um, you have to then also pick some control items. This is, this is how the um, algorithm works, is that these control items are a couple of products that are in the same category that are known to be strong performers in the market and a couple that have been seen to be weak performers. And so we leverage those items to be able to wait and filter the responses of the consumers um, and pull out the people who are really good predictors for this category and this group of products and weight their answers more heavily. Um, the folks who really don't get it, they're not able to identify, you know, a winner from a dog, then we will weight their responses across the new products less heavily, and that's how we're able to make this a predictive algorithm. Basic information is needed about products in order to test them, the name, description, um, planned MSRP or test price, and ideally cost information so that we can feedback um, gross margin impact as well. Then uh, we engage with consumers and uh, we ask them a couple of upfront survey questions. This is very important from the perspective of a wholesaler because um, they're able to then identify consumers who are buying in one channel versus another, another and then be able to look specifically at responses from customers who are buying, say, on Amazon or at Macy's, and this is now possible to actually pick multiple responses. Um, then once we... Um, have figured out a little bit more about those consumers, we start showing them a series of products. So you can see that there are up to five images included here to be able to help people understand what this product is really about. There's also um, a detailed description that's provided, so we're, we're certain that consumers get a good feel for product. Then three basic pieces of information are requested. One is, what do you think somebody would pay for this product? Uh, the next is, what do you think of it? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Somewhere in between. And then there's also the opportunity to give uh, detailed comments. And so, you know, this is where the tell us more comes in, right? That consumers can and do quite often give very specific feedback. They love to give their opinions about these products. And these comments have turned out to be very useful for our customers in understanding why a product fared well or didn't, being able to peel back the onion and get a, get a better understanding. So once consumers have answered those three questions about the series of products, which are typically maybe 10 to 15 products that they would be testing, um, we then apply our predictive analytics based, again, on the, the weighting and filtering by how respondents answered. Did they get it on those um, control items or not? Then we're able to put out a value score for each product. And the value score has been shown to be predictive of market performance of products across every category and geography that we've worked in. Um, value scores of seven through 10 statistically outperform value score four through six products and dramatically outperform products that score one through three. So this is the kind of information then that comes to our customers. They would see a ranking of products by value score um, from highest to lowest and they also get feedback about people's willingness to pay and sentiment about the product. So looking at this specifically for one given product, the kind of information, um, in this case, this product received a value score of nine. There are a few reasons for that. One is that the model price, which is the prediction of average unit retail price across the life cycle of the product, was very close to the test price or the planned MSRP. Um, so that's showing that people are, in fact, willing to pay that kind of money for this product. The other factor is that the positive sentiment was 43%, which is quite high, and definitely higher than the negative sentiment on the product. Um, so overall, this was a strong performing product. Um, what you also see here is, is the demand curve. This is the distribution of demand across various price points. And um, Gartner, which is the leading 
research firm, analyst firm uh, for technology companies, has told us repeatedly that First Insight is, is the only company that is able to provide an elasticity curve for products before they have any sales history. So this is the kind of information that is provided about products that are tested by our customers. Now, where this gets particularly interesting and granular for wholesale companies is that, as we discussed, we're able to ask up front, you know, where do you buy your shoes? Um, and in this case, uh, we've been able to split this out by, you know, I buy online, I buy in department stores, I buy in mid-tier mid retailers. Then we're able to provide information about which styles are faring and performing better um, in which different channel. And so this is helping a wholesale company figure out what the right assortment would be, you know, for department stores versus specialty retailers. So at this point, I'd like to hand things over to Keith so that he can tell you specifically how Calaris has been working with the First Insight solution. Okay, thanks, Gretchen. So again, um, Keith Duplain, I'm the um, general manager for today, the Dr. Scholl's division for Calaris. I've been uh, a wholesaler for about 18 years and um, over here at Calaris for about 11. And so pretty good handle on and sort of the challenges that all of us is in, in regardless of what category of wholesale face. And like I said before, you know, it's, it's really about how do you, what's the growth, what sort of strategies can you put in place to um, grow your brands? And then, you know, what are the tools that help facilitate that? And so I'll go deeper into um, our experiences with First Insight and, you know, kind of the world that we also put it in is not only predictive analytics, but how do you use consumer data today? And for a wholesale company, um, I think that some of that isn't always uh, culturally ingrained. Um, you know, it's, it's over time, it's grown up as a more entrepreneurial endeavor. And I think some of the tools available today are really helping us evolve. So for those of you that aren't that familiar with Calaris, um, you know, we are a footwear company that's been around for about over 135 years, uh, 2.6 billion in revenue, and we're really focused only on wholesale, uh, or only on footwear, excuse me. These are the brands that we cover. We have the famous footwear stores, um, Sam Edelman through Carlos Santana, Lifestride. You know, so we really organize ourselves into three platforms, one being um, retail platform that focuses on the family, Second one, uh, contemporary fashion, and finally, th healthy living, which is more, you know, uh, better for me products, comfort oriented. And that's where Dr. Scholes sits and we'll talk, um, mostly about healthy living because we, that particular platform was the first to adopt First Insight, um, for Calaris. So as part of a way of background, we already, based on, um, the number of brands we have and the consumers we interact with on a daily and seasonal base, we already have a lot of insights available to us. But one of the things that, um, you know, we all deal with is we have historical data and then we have our trend data. And there seem to be, um, you know, sort of a missing piece in there and, and a portion or a point to bring in additional data points um, that were more timely and relevant um, with what was actually going on in the consumer's mind today that we could put in that mix to make better decisions. And again, sort of how we got to where we are. So um, what were we looking for? You know, kind of give you guys a little background. We don't, in, in terms of how we approach um, anything at Claris, it's not so much about the software as the solution as what is the, what was the particular problem that we were trying to solve and then what would help us facilitate that. And, you know, we all hear, you read, you know, about how in control the consumer is today um, of your brand. And so understanding really what was going on with him or her, like I said before, in a more timely manner was really paramount to um, us finding, you know, additional tools and solutions that um, um, we could put in our data set and our analysis and our planning. Um, the idea that, again, is wholesalers, um, you know, we had to be able to uh, affect a large portion of, um, you know, the population here, whether it be the product people or the merchandising staff or the sales team. 
And so we needed something that was, you know, relatively easy to implement, easy to understand, and cost effective. Um, so, again, one more thing, the reason we let us down to um, First Insight. And then the it all kind of, you know, comes back to the consumer has um, – so much a say and so many choices. We all, you know, it's it's their one click away from the next brand, the next retailer. So how do you take, you know, with sort of an aggregated large group of people and understand how to cater to different pockets of them? You know, it could be your core customer. It could be your fashion customer. It could be a customer with a special needs situation. And so how do you understand what they're really looking for, what they're willing to pay, what they like about your products? And if you do it on a historical perspective in footwear, the cycles are, you know, seasonal. So it really takes a long time to learn um, versus, again, you know, having a way to put the consumer at the center. You know, the qualitative or the focus groups are one way, but it's just not quick enough and it's certainly not cost efficient enough. So um, this whole idea of the consumer understanding really drove uh, a lot of our decisions. And then you know, uh, I think I kind of touched on this before, but um, making sure that whatever we had became actionable from the organization, that it was, you know, um, uh, you know, people had put stake in the data and would actually go out and act on it versus something that, you know, uh, again, some of our uh, mechanisms wholesale become a bit more opinion based. And we wanted something that, you know, people could believe in. So, um, you know, so we, we're kind of off, you know, challenged with this fundamental problem, right? You know, we, as a wholesaler, you know, um, you have, an, you know, uh, I guess opinions, you have hypotheses around who your customer is, but you need to be able to close that gap with them. And so that's where, you know, we signed on. Um, you know, with First Insight. And they've helped us facilitate and, you know, narrow that down, you know, uh, obviously quite dramatically over the last 18 months or so that we've been working together. Um, so how we got started, um, again, we first identified the problem um, and then, you know, kind of came back to what were potential solutions. Um, and this started, you know, back you know, really with the emergence of company looking at how to mine their data in more effective ways. Um, you know, we, again, we knew that we were probably missing a bit of that. Uh, as wholesalers, you know, you get your, you know, your weekly selling reports, you can get some door analysis, um, you can get a lot through your websites, but if you don't have a large retail presence, it's really hard to, um, you know, get enough quantitative data to be able to, um, uh, drive the decisions. So back in 2014, we ran a pilot with First Insight. Um, and honestly, we were somewhat sort of skeptical at the beginning because, you know, you, you, you again, any sort of software becomes or, or tool becomes, um, you know, you, you have, you have to vet it out. And, and we, uh, we decided to sign up for a pilot to really say, you know, could, could we justify in an ROI way the value we were getting um, out of the solution? And then, you know, how would the organization adapt it and would it become uh, actionable enough with granular enough data to be able to change decisions from the team uh, on a daily basis? And, and so in that pilot, um, we, um, we tested both uh, Dr. Scholl's and Naturalizer and, and really were um, really pleasantly surprised with um, the insights that it gave us on what things we had assumed but didn't really have, again, that, that sort of quantitative data on. And I think really out of the box um, going into, um, I think even the current seasons, we were trying to make adjustments based on what we learned. And since then, have you know proved out several of those with um, you know positive ROI. So how does the uh, you know how does it? I'll tell you how it worked in terms of what you know worked for us, and then um, you know how we implemented it. But you know the thing is that it's got to seem seamless to your brand. Um, 
it can't, you know, it, it can't feel, we didn't want anything that felt like, you know, we were trying to get a consumer that we wanted to engage with, with a third party. It needed to feel like, you know, it was coming from us to get that sort of genuine, you know, authentic feedback. And so everything that uh, First Insight did really helped us to make it brand appropriate. And these, this is an example of what, um, this, this, uh, the survey, this game that the, uh, our consumers got and, um, uh, you know, in the process they went through to give us that feedback. So, you know, the first thing is, you know, touched on a little bit is, is you have to get granular. The, you know, it, there are so many retail segments within retail segments. There are, um, you know, retailers that have you know, different profiles of consumers or different objectives at which they're trying to, you know, drive in their organization. So being able to get really granular and understand who you're talking to is, in my opinion, the only way to make it actionable. So we kind of work together to figure out that, you know, again, as a wholesaler, we didn't have an extensive uh, database of people to be able to, to um, you know, correspond with and send the game. So we had to go out and use third-party databases. And then through, you know, a series of the questions that I'll walk you guys through is, is figure out who they really were and if they were appropriate for what we were trying to learn. Um, in, and as we've run these things, the other thing is we don't, we don't always check test just to find out if an item's good. A lot of times, you know, we may check to understand, we check to understand, uh, consumer res receptivity to things like categories and classifications. I mean, there was a lot that's been going on in the women's boot market with the mix of booties to tall boots over the last year. And we really, we even dove in to understand how she was thinking about um, you know, those categories as it related to whether she liked or didn't like more tall boots or short boots. So going back to understanding who you're talking to and getting to that target audience becomes really, really important. So in this particular uh, instance, um, we were going after, um, you know, family, the mid-tier channel, um, and really um, wanted to understand people that, or women in this case, that, you know, a, where did they shop? Because that was going to help make it more actionable. Um, I can't uh, remember exactly which test this was from, but um, and I'll talk about it more in a minute. But one of the things is if you're not talking to the consumer of the retailer that you want to influence, it does you no good. So in this particular case, we were very specific about the retailer that we wanted to be able to share our brand's insights with. So we went, you know, and found the consumer that shops at that retail location. Um, and then we you know, vetted them out through a series of questions about, you know, how many pairs of shoes do they buy a year to um, what were they really going to, you know, what was their use um, or what was their intended use for these shoes. And Gretchen talked about it earlier is, you know, they have to be um, involved in the category. They've got to be um, opinion savvy so that, the information, you know, really becomes valid. So, you know, people that weren't, you know, heavy users of footwear um, were weeded out. People that didn't want, um, you know, or didn't, weren't looking for, you know, the weekend or the casual location, occasion, they were weeded out. So we really got down to um, data sets that that um, statistically valid, and we felt good about who we were talking to and the feedback that they gave us. So, this is um this is one of the tests we ran um and you know we've we've tested all different types of products and different retailers and um you know I think that each time it is it this is particularly a tool that sits with inside of you know again the other uh information and data points that you would get you know it it's never been solely you know we only use First Insight. We still use a lot of historical data, you know, retail performance, uh, vendor scorecards, um, other quantitative data available to us in the market, and we still use a lot of trend services. But this married with that's given us a lot of insights, and I think every test that we've run has really, um, you know, we've gotten something out of it. So. Like Gretchen talked about, we're testing model price. We're testing what they like about the silhouette. But one of the things that's probably um, 
we didn't know this going in, but one of the things that has been the most beneficial is these uh, the consumer comments and being able to extract word clouds and get um, frequency of particular you know buzzwords that consumers were associating with our shoes, and that allowed us you know in some cases to make you know changes in terms of um, you know what they loved or didn't love about it. And this one um, was interesting, and I think how this one actually shook out is that we ended up modifying the material a, a li slightly because of some of the feedback that we received, and so. Um, the, um, you know, again, just other examples, you know, we would always, the you know, one thing you have to do is how you set these tests up become really important to, um, you know, how the data comes out. So in working with the teams and when you implement this, we found that, it you know, you have to have a point person, you have to go through, and First Insight was great about this, sort of training the teams on how you put the test together. We didn't, we don't have the resources or the bandwidth to be able to put people dedicated against this, but we did point, put a corporate person as sort of the point person to be able to facilitate the test internally and help the teams, you know, um, sort of vet out what they wanted to learn. You know, in this particular case, we, you know, we, it was wedge sandals. And then, you know, it was down to price points and materials were other things that we were looking to understand, silhouette as well in this. Um, so, uh, you know, the consumer walks through your branded experience and, you know, comes out on the other side. And, and we did have the options, and I, I, I can't know which brands have done it, but where you can actually do bounce back offers and stuff too. So you can take a consumer that, you know, may or may not be uh, – a uh, consumer of your brand, an advocate for your brand, and uh, actually try and turn them into a sale too. So there's, there's actually a revenue model sitting on the backside of this. But the consumer walks through the entire, um, you know, uh, the game, and then very quickly, First Insight was able to, you know, get us the data because part of it also comes down to how quickly does the actionable data come back to the teams to be able to then you know, affect future decisions. You can't sit and wait on this stuff for, um, you know, weeks. And, and I think that I think the longest we've had the waits maybe like three days. So um, very quickly we would get these decision trees then that would allow us to, okay, how, how do we now want to plan that, that uh, particular item? So you have the word cloud giving you, you know, qualitative data around how the consumer sees it. And then you've also got the decision trees that really become the backbone for how the merchant teams and sales teams, you know, uh, go through the uh, process of, of planning that particular item. We have shared these with retailers, um, and I'll, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that maybe in a minute. The So, you know, the value score is pretty straightforward, right? Seven to ten, four to six, one to three. Um and, and what we would, you know, literally, I don't know that we've, there's a few items that we've thrown out, like the Madison, um, we actually ended up not making. The balance of what's on this sheet we made, we just would either scale the inventory, um, our expectations for the item, or in some cases, the price points down to make it, um, you know, a better sell-through. The, I think it, anytime you, you know, adopt something that's, I say reasonably foreign and certainly uh, an adjustment of culture and process in the step. I don't think anybody was willing to just sort of you know, jump in with two feet and put, you know, total faith in the, in the particular um, system and, and tool. So we, we've kind of waded in and decided, you know, what kind of risk do we want to take on the best sellers and then how do we really want to minimize or adjust our merchandising strategies with the, um, the ones that scored lower. So the other thing about this is that we did, in fact, um, we, would, we, shared, we shared this with several retailers, um, quite a lot of our big ones, in fact. And as you can expect with anything, you know, no different than installing this in your wholesale, you know, uh, team. At the retail level, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a learning curve. We have uh, retailers that have absolutely embraced the data and are willing to, you know, adjust and act accordingly with us. And then we also have ones that were, you know, 
highly skeptical. And so, you know, part of um, it's not a, you know, again, it's not it's not sort of a, a a solution you can just walk in and hand somebody. There's a huge education process because the idea of using you know extensive real time data sets is just it's it's not you know culturally ingrained in a lot of uh, um, you know us in the the wholesale and, and fashion space. So um, a bit of a, a learning curve there. And 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 actually, when Gretchen asked asked us to do this, one of the reasons that um, I thought this webinar would be important is because the more the more companies and the more that we start to speak in this way, I think the more that it gets adopted, the more uh, scale and, and understanding we sort of all collectively get better. Um, and I, I think that there, this represents what the future is, and the faster we get there depends on you know how um, how everybody learns collectively. So that's, so um, this was, you know, these decision trees become a, a real focus for how we communicate the findings up and down the organization. And, and when I say that is, I, I think, you know, without fail, almost every department within inside of our wholesale platforms get touched by this data. Um, you know, it, it, it affects the product teams and how, you know, if they need to adjust current product or how they think about the, the next season or the next trip, um, it affects the uh, the merchandisers and, you know, again, to the extent of what they're going to buy or what we can pay for the item with a particular factory partner. And it certainly affects um, sales in terms of their sales forecast and, and the um, uh, emphasis they're going to put on a particular item with the retailer. So this has uh, and gets communicated um again, throughout the organization. These sheets were the output of, um, uh, you know, more granular data around the item. And I don't think we have any of the word clouds, but we would couple this with, you know, the word clouds and really try and understand, you know, uh, what in this particular case she was saying about the item. And so, um, you know, value score 10, um, that's great, but the retail price, the um, the retail price was the other component in in trying to maximize gross margin, you know, or velocity to end up with you know um, fewer units at the end of the season. Um, you know, we we started to play with a lot of elasticity uh, curves and understand the demand at different price points, and and really maximize that. That's another function that I don't believe is you know, done particularly well in the wholesale business. And this is a fairly easy tool to be able to use. Um, they haven't shown you here, but you can actually, you know, uh, they can work, people at First Insight can work with you, slide those demand curves and understand the elasticity at different price points. And, and particularly where um, we were working with um, um, some mass-based retailers, um, that was highly uh, important to be able to, um, you know, understand that things in, in that particular market are very elastic and, you know, small changes in price points could do. So, uh, again, you know, output sheets that we've relied heavily on. Um, and here's a particular, another example. And, and I go back to the point about you cannot just look at the value score and, um, you know, say, wow, it's, it's a five. I'm not going to buy it. It really becomes you know, that's another data point to say, you know, is it priced right? Is it materialized right? You know, how how do we think about this particular shoe for the future of our brand? And and so we would, a lot of times, I said with maybe a couple of exceptions, we would continue to make the items. We would just adjust them um, so that their impact on the business, predominantly from a negative standpoint, couldn't be that great, and we've kind of minimized the risk. So... Um, you know, where are we going? Uh, the, it, I said earlier, it was started with, uh, in the healthy living brands, um, Naturalizer, Dr. Scholl's, um, I've used it predominantly. We are moving it into our contemporary brands. Um, I believe Franco Sardo is going to begin testing some stuff. And, and, you know, each brand has a, a different question or a different opportunity to solve for. And so, um, you know, we kind of 
you know, again, with First Insights help, are moving the tool um, into the, um, you know, the divisions based on how they want to take historical data, trend data, and now consumer insights and, and figure out um, best course of action. Things like defining um, new core um, become, uh, you know, a top priority uh, for a lot of our brands, and this is a fairly effective tool in that because you can get to the people that understand what you historically have stood for and are help, are really good at, um, at helping you find out how to so ever tweak that dial and move it forward ever so slightly. Um, so some of the other stuff that, um, you know, I, I would call it is the really important things to think about are um, the – aligning your entire organization and educating them behind this particular tool um, to make sure that it gets adopted. You know, they know how to use the data um, becomes, you know, very important. Um, taking it and then, you know, working with your retail partners. Um, of course, it can live behind the scenes, but we found that, you know, um, you know that educational product, process, that sort of industry knowledge, I think there's a lot of benefit for all of us. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, I guess, you know, I just kind of close with the, uh, um, we, you know, as, as we roll forward and Claris, we're just going to continue to actively test and learn against, um, you know, where the consumer's going and, and what the opportunities are. So I don't know, Gretchen, did I miss anything you want me to, uh, come back and highlight? Keith, I think that was um, that was very thorough. One of the things that we did talk about was yeah. the um, the ROI potential that um, yeah. was uncovered, and, and you yeah. made some comments about that in yeah. our earlier discussions. Yeah, yeah. So we, I think um, I touched on it. I mean, when we uh, signed up for the solution, um, you know, publicly traded company, everything has to have a you know positive ROI over time. And so it became really important um, through the, t the pilot phase and then really, you know, as, as an ongoing order of process to be able to validate um, and justify the expense that we're putting against it. And, and that was – it was true on day one, and it's still uh, true today. Great. Right. Thanks, Keith. So uh, I guess, Amber, do you want to put yeah. in some questions? Thank you guys. I'll I'll take it from here. So um, thank you to you to you both for that. That was great. And if anybody wants to submit any questions, you can do so now via the Q and A pod. I already have a few that we'll get started with. So Keith, how do you get the company to adopt this across different areas? Uh, the you know I mean it's it's an educational process. Um, again, I would I would give First Insight very high marks. Um, for working with the team, um, you know, kind of from knowing absolutely nothing to um, understanding how to use the tool. And then um, it, as we brought in new departments and we, you know, we would get further into the analysis process and stuff, um, you know, they kind of, you know, worked with us to make sure that everybody stayed on board. They were here frequently to review the data. Uh, the results, and, um, um, you know, over time, people built confidence. Amazing. Thank you. Um, Gretchen, how does a wholesaler get direct access to the retailer's customer? Um, great question, Amber. Thanks. So, you know, not surprisingly, um, many wholesalers do not have their own uh, CRM database that's very, very large with consumer emails in it, and um, even more so, they might not have that split or tagged by where consumers actually buy their shoes. Um, so we work with most of our wholesale customers um, using a third-party resource to access email addresses and um, run the tests that way, <clears throat> as Keith mentioned, still in a very branded approach so that, you know, the look and feel is coming out from um, our customer, not from First Insight. So it's branded, you know, in their case, Dr. Scholes or, or Franco Sarto. Um, and, you know, we do have that weighting and filtering built into the model. 
so we're able to send this out to a pretty broad po population, um, do the segmentation by those questions based on where people purchase their, their shoes in this case and any other questions that are, that are asked. Um, and then are able to use those third-party emails to um, answer the questions for our customers. Thanks. Amber, are you there? Yeah. We lost Amber. Oh. Sorry, you've got me. Sorry, I was talking and didn't realize I had muted myself. So um, I just had said thank you to you, Gretchen, for that. And then, Keith, we have another question for you. Um, how did this solution and approach change your relationship with your retail partners? Um, I, You know, I, I don't know that it's changed the relationship with the retail partners. Like I said, I think I think there's an educational process, and it's part of um, – you know, it's part of the dialogue. It's part of the business planning. Um, you know, so first is getting them to understand and 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 see value in the tool, and then secondly is you know how do you work the data into um, you know your sales approach or your planning approach, and and that's that's an ongoing you know um, process with us. Uh, I think again, highlight again is that it's just a lot of these tools are relatively new, and um, Right. Uh, not full adoption on day one, so continue to educate. Got it. Um, Gretchen, what formula is the formula for model price? Great question. Um, so essentially we take all the um, answers that were given through through that game interface, so what would they pay, um, and also – um, the sentiment, so basically that's the what do you think someone would pay responses and, you know, love it to hate it scale responses. We take those data and filter and weight them based on the respondents' answers on those control items, the strong and weak performers. Uh, we use that to create the price elasticity curve, um, that, that distribution of demand, and then identify the average price, um, price based on that curve. So that's what dictates the model price. Got it. Um, another one for you. Do these insights focus on design elements versus? Um, they focus more on design elements um, because, you know, in, in reality, those are much easier to convey um, in, in this sort of a model, right? So there are up to five images and descriptions. Uh, where we do see fit coming into play more is that there are, there are coming to be more of those um, fit types of apparel where you have, say, relaxed fit versus tailored, et cetera. And so those we are able to, to test along the way. Um, but it is, it is primarily uh, design elements. And I'd also add that um, we are able to test across the product development timeline. So it's fairly common, you know, for a design to be tested early. It might even be in the CAD stage. Um, and then, you know, be um, changed, modified, as Keith alluded to, based on feedback that's received, um, and then test it again at the sample stage and maybe test it even another time right before it goes to market. So this can be a, an iterative process as well. Really interesting. Um, Keith, I'm, we have another question, and it starts with um, just a comment. I'm not sure if I completely understood. When initially setting up with First Insight, was Calaris able to choose the First Insight's consumers that are taking these tests and producing the data? Were you able to choose your customer segments in this way? Um, so well, when we initially signed up, we did have some – um, of our own databases that we could test against. You know, Naturalizer Retail, for example, had a database set large enough that we could test certain items against. But we very quickly, um, for it to be an effective tool for us to, you know, grow our wholesale and capture market share, we had to find and understand the consumers that were, that we wanted or, um, that were at our particular retail location. So that third party piece became um, very critical early in the game. Got it. Thank you. Um, Gretchen, on average, how many customer results do you get per round? Um, great question. So 
Um, because of the nature of our algorithm and the use of those control items to weight and filter, we only need on the order of uh, maybe average 200 completed responses in order to uh, close out a test with statistically significant uh, results. Hmm. Interesting. Um, another one for you, Gretchen. Do you guys also work with party supply companies, or is it just mainly focused on fashion and apparel? Um, we actually do work across a wide variety of categories. Um, party supplies does happen to be within that group. Um, we also work with Things Remembered, for example, in more of the kind of giftware. Um, we, we work with Dick's Sporting Goods, uh, as an example, and other sporting goods companies. We work in some food and packaging, um, apparel, handbags. You know, so it's a, a very broad range, and um, our customers are also across North America and Europe, and um, we have some of our customers testing in Asia and Latin America as well. Amazing. Um, I think that that is actually all the time we have for questions. So, Keith and Gretchen, I don't know if you have any other comments that you wanted to make before we kind of wrap up. Um, please feel free to do so. I just want to thank everyone for attending, and you know, if anyone has questions or there will further questions, there will be um, ways for you to reach out. Um, thank you very much, Keith, for um, for your involvement in this. Yes, and, and thank you both. And I'd like to also thank WWD very much for setting this up. Well, thank you guys, and thank you to everyone who is listening in. We really appreciate you joining us. The webinar um, recording will be available after the fact, so we'll make sure to be sharing that with you over the next few days. And if you have any questions or need to be in contact with anybody, um, you can feel, to, feel free to reach out to WWD directly. I'll also make sure that um, my email is in the chat window in case anybody needs it, but we'll be communicating out to you so you have all necessary information. So thank um, you guys again for joining us. And I just wanted to see if Keith has any final comments. No, I'm, I, again, enjoyed doing this and uh, hope that uh, as an industry we can become a bit more data-driven by using tools like this. Agreed. Well, thank you both. Thank you, everyone. And we hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. Bye. Bye-bye.